Okay, so everyone, please sit down and uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Quentin Jennis, one of our R3s, who actually has a master's degree in ethics. He's going to talk to us about ethics, so it's uh, something he knows a lot about. Thanks. All right, so uh, good morning. Uh, like Dr. Santum said, I'm for those of you I haven't met yet, I'm one of the plus one residents here at St. Paul's. I'm here to give you a chat that I've called Making Ethics Work for Us, ER Decision Making Beyond the Autonomy, Paternalism, Dichotomy, which after Dr. Schurmeyer's great clickbait title I know is very long and wordy and unwieldy, and I apologize for that. But what I want to talk about today is something that we do all the time in the context of the emergency department, and that is um, have difficult conversations and help make difficult decisions um, in the department. And I'm thinking difficult maybe in a few particular circumstances. First thing I'm thinking about, the situation where that autonomous patient, a patient with capacity, is making a particular request or has an expectation that we are unwilling to meet for reasons of their own health or for population health. Maybe that MRI for that acute no red flags lower back pain or that course of antibiotics for that non-bacterial infection or that long-term course of opiates for the chronic pain that they're experiencing. The second type of difficult conversation I'm thinking about is maybe that goals of care conversation where somebody, usually a non-expert, has to make a difficult decision, often with high stakes, with incomplete knowledge of what's going to happen during the patient's admission. And the first thing that I want to do while we think about those conversations is say something that's really obvious, and that is that the ethical frameworks that inhabit our mind have enormous implications on how those, pay, how those conversations play out, both for the patient's well-being, but also for our own well-being. And that's true regardless of whether or not we're consciously aware of those ethical frameworks. And the second thing that I want to talk about just a little bit beyond that is the way that the particular medical ethical framework that we've inherited, which sees these conversations as taking place in a necessary tension between autonomy and paternalism, has a lot of strengths but also has some emphases that might need to be nuanced in order to make our ethics work for us. And that's a lot of mumbo jumbo and I'll try to explain what I mean, but first of all, I wanted to give you just a little primer of what brings me to this particular conversation. So like Dr. Sensrum said, um, I've always been interested in these questions, and I uh, found a sneaky way to take a year off in between my second and third year of medical school, and I moved to Scotland and did a one-year master's degree focused in biomedical ethics at the University of St. Andrews, uh, which is in the town of St. Andrews in Scotland. And uh, many of you might have heard of St. Andrews um, for one of two reasons, usually less so the university. The first reason St. Andrews is well known is because of the royals, so that's where Prince William went to school and where he met his now wife, Kate Middleton. Um, they weren't there when I was there, but it is funny. St. Andrews is this tiny little town, and at every little convenience store and coffee shop, there's this huge blown-up poster on the wall of the one time that Prince William was in there to buy gum or something. So they love the Royals. Uh, the second reason you might have heard of St. Andrews is because of golf. So St. Andrews is the home of the Royal and Ancient Golf Course, which is the oldest golf club in the world. Um, it's also considered by many to be the ongoing home of golf. And I am not a golfer, and I really don't know anything about golfing culture or etiquette, as we will see in a minute. But I did try to make a brief foray into the world of golf when I was at St. Andrews. And I got lucky because the British Open was held at the Royal and Ancient Golf Course the year that I was studying there. And for those of you who know as little about golf as I did, the British Open is one of the four major uh, golf uh, tournaments that takes place on the professional circuit every year. And so I think it was on the Saturday of the British Open that me and one of my buddies went and sort of decided to walk around outside the venue and see what we could see. And we were walking around to the back side of the course on the outside of this big fence. We ran into this big scary looking American guy wearing this vest that said ESPN camera security. And he said in this deep southern scary voice, you boys trying to sneak into the British Open today? I was pretty sure he couldn't do anything to us, so I said, yeah, actually, we are. Um, and he turned out to be a real hero because he said, oh, no problem, let me help you out. And so he, he snuck us in through this back media entrance, and all of a sudden I found myself right in the middle of the action in the British Open. And I remember looking up, and the first thing I saw was Ty, who's probably the only golfer I would have recognized, uh, preparing for his tee shot on one of the holes there, and seized by some kind of nerdy tourist instinct, I pulled up my big iPad out of my bag and took this grainy photograph of Tiger Woods preparing for his swing. 
Now, I mentioned earlier that I didn't know very much about golfing etiquette, and if I had, I would have known that it is a rather catastrophic no-no to take a picture of a golfer while they're in a moment like this, particularly if the little clicky sound is on on your iPad. And so, predictably, everyone turned and looked at me, and I was unceremoniously booted out of the British Open uh, only seconds after successfully sneaking my land. So all of that to say that I hope that my foray into the world of ethics is slightly more successful than my foray into the world of golf. Um, but I had a great time in St. Andrews, and since I've been back in Canada, I've tried to keep engaged in ethics conversations in all kinds of different ways. Last year, I had the privilege of being the resident member on the CMA Committee for Ethics, and I've had the opportunity to publish a bit here and there, which has been really gratifying. So uh, that's sort of what brings me to this present conversation. But today, like I said, I want to sit for a few minutes thinking about some difficult conversations and decisions that take place into the emergency department and consider how our ethics frameworks might help us in the context of those moments. And to do that, first of all, I want to just run through some basic stuff, throw some things in the air that I promise will land later on, and I call that what ethics is and why we do it. Then I want to talk about autonomy and paternalism, and then again land on some hopefully practical so what's for us? So first of all, the dilemma. Uh, ethicists love dilemmas, and uh, as, we, as we will see, I have a particular soapbox that says ethics is about so much more than just solving dilemmas. I think when lots of people think about ethics and ethicists, they think about just sort of solving these kind of rock and hard place dilemmas. Would you push someone in front of a train if there was a bunch of people tied to the tracks down the line, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's so much more helpful to think of ethics as, as a practice, a practice just as much about avoiding these kind of rock and hard place dilemmas as it is about sort of navigating your way out of them when you get there. So ethics is about more than dilemmas, but with that being said, dilemmas can be powerfully instructive. And so I want to get to the tension that I'm trying to speak today as precisely as possible by phrasing it as a dilemma. And I'll do that using the two situations that I mentioned at the beginning. So first of all, the situation where an autonomous patient, a person with capacity, has a persistent request that you are unwilling to meet for the reasons of their own safety or well-being or population safety or well-being. Phrased through a certain lens, your action and our action in that situation is paternalism, which is something bad. But phrased through a different lens, our action in that situation is care, which is something good. So is that action paternalism, or is it care, or is it both, and if so, how does that make sense, and why does it matter? The second type of conversation I mentioned above, the goals of care conversation, and for those of you who were at the St. Paul's conference, Dr. Willis Cross gave a talk around this that I learned a lot from and pointed to this dilemma when he talked about making recommendations in the context of goals of care conversations. And he talked about the way that all of us have been trained appropriately to place such an emphasis on autonomy that we often sort of just list through people's options, but people often turn around and say, well, what's your recommendation? And he talked about the way we're often uncomfortable to give recommendations because we don't want to interfere with their autonomy. And so is a recommendation or even a strong recommendation in a goals of care conversation paternalism, which is something bad, or is it care, which is something good, or is it both, and if so, how does that make sense, and why does it matter? That's a dilemma, the tension that I'm trying to speak to today. So first of all, some basic stuff that I promise will become important later on. What ethics is, first of all, ethics is a project of giving words to our moral intuitions. And everyone knows we live in this great world with all kinds of different worldviews, but whenever we come together to do society, and more narrowly when we come together to do what we call profession, we assume we have certain kinds of common moral intuitions about what human beings are and the rights and dignity that are owed to them as being persons. And ethics is a task of taking those moral intuitions that we all feel and giving precise words to them. And all of us are familiar with this kind of project because that's what we do in medicine all the time. Someone comes in and they say, I'm dizzy and weak. And we invent precise words like vertigo and presyncope to enable our engagement with the vague things that somebody is feeling. And ethics is that same project with respect to our moral intuitions. And the one other little thing to see on this point is that this project, just like our medical naming projects, can be more or less precise which makes our ethics more or less helpful. And as our ethical language is precise, we have integrity between what we feel, what we say and think, and what we do. But as our ethical frameworks and emphases are more blunt or miss the mark, there can be dissonance between what we feel, what we say and think, and what we do. And that dissonance is important, as we will see, not only logically, but also for our own well-being. 
Secondly, ethics is a task of shaping our moral intuitions, and this is obvious as in, in a general sense when we teach kids to share and not hit each other and stuff, but it's also relevant when we talk about particular professional ethics, which are attached to particular roles in society, like the role of a doctor. And this is not a new idea. Probably the first great ethics text in the Western tradition is called Nicomachean Ethics, and is written, written by a Greek philosopher named Aristotle, who I'm sure you've heard of, about 2,500 years ago. And on the first page of the Nicomachean Ethics, he says, human beings are engaged in all of these different arts or practices. And the first example he lists of an art or a practice is medicine. And he says, if you want to know what's good for a practitioner of any of these given practices, you need to know what each of those practices is for. And what medicine is for, he says, is health. And so if you want to know what an ethical doctor looks like most broadly, you look at someone who knows how to conduct themselves in such a way to produce health. And part of that is obviously medical expertise, but just as much of that is our skills as educators and advocates and communicators and all those other CanMed roles. And so ethics, broadly speaking, is a project of giving words to our moral intuitions, but also of shaping our moral intuitions to the particular task that we perform as doctors, which, most broadly speaking, is producing health. Secondly, and again quickly, why we do ethics. This first point goes without saying, we do ethics because the things that we believe about what's right and wrong have enormous implications on our patients' well-being. But secondly, and this is under-recognized, we do ethics for the good of ourselves and of our teams. And appropriately, in research and hospital and university settings, there's been a really important emphasis over the past you know, 10, 20 years on physician wellness and the factors that promote our wellness. And on the other hand, the things when we talk about burnout and compassion fatigue and these kinds of things that can produce lack of wellness over time. And one of the sort of uh, concepts that's popping up more and more in this literature um, over the past several years is this notion of moral injury. And I've just listed three publications from the past sort of five or six months that engage in this idea on this slide. And moral injury is a very brief primer for those of you who are unfamiliar, is a phrase that came out of social scientists doing researchers on military personnel in the 90s, but since then has been expanded and looked at human beings in all kinds of different roles across society. And all that moral injury is, according to these researches is that feeling of dissonance when what you, the ethical framework you've accepted makes you feel that you should do something different than what you find yourself doing in a particular situation. And according to the researchers, this dissonance is compounded when there is a kind of authority involved or, and or when there's a high stakes situation. And this harkens back again to the importance of the precision of our ethical project. Because when there is dissonance between what we feel, what we say and think, and what we do, that dissonance over time can produce this sort of notion of moral injury, which is one of the things that contributes to lack of wellness. So broadly speaking, we do ethics for the good of our patients, but also for the good of ourselves and of our teams. So with all of that long prolegomena out of the way, we'll talk a little bit about the four principles. And this, hark this connects to a book that all of you will have heard of. This book was published 40 years ago by two American guys um, in 1979 um, and has been the foundation for all of medical school uh, ethics curricula over the past sort of 30 35 years. And in the introduction of this book, these two authors, they marvel. They say there's been remarkable continuity in medical ethics tradition across millennia. For thousands of years, the way doctors have approached patients, broadly speaking, has been the same. But they say there's really a fundamental ambiguity in this tradition, despite the continuity. And so what we need are clinical decision rules. What we need isn't just gestalt. We need outline of some clear, unambiguous goods or principles that can help us guide our difficult interactions in conversations that we deal with on the ground. And as everyone knows, they prop propose these four principles, justice, non-maleficence, beneficence, and respect for personal autonomy. And this really was and remains a field-changing work in ethics, and really sort of um, started a conversation that's still very young and exciting and evolving. I often think it's funny, as someone who's very interested in, in medicine and also interested in ethics, how the research worlds are so different. You know, we just heard a talk on how something that was published a year ago is now obsolete, whereas in ethics, when we, you know, people are still reading and debating Aristotle, something that was published 40 years ago is still seen as this sort of really new, evolving research that people are still debating. 
And the biggest question that's been put to this framework when it was first published and now is simply and obviously how we use it. How do we apply these principles in real ethical dilemmas? Because an ethical dilemma is not a situation where there is one unambiguously good outcome and one unambiguously bad one, where you can simply apply a principle and go to the good way. An ethical dilemma by definition is a situation where different goods or potential goods or principles conflict with each other. And what we need is not just articulation of various goods, but we need an understanding of how to compare them with each other when they conflict with each other. And in all of the situations that I've, that I've outlined above, and, the, and in the most common sort of um, ethical tension that people find themselves in, there is a tension between autonomy and another principle. So the antibiotics has a tension between what someone wants and population health, which falls under the banner of justice. Or in other cases where what someone wants, we believe according to the evidence, is harmful to them, where there is an inherent tension between the good of their choosing their own health care outcomes and the other goods of beneficence and non-maleficence or justice. And there is an inherent tension, and will always be in many of our interactions, inherent tensions between these different potential goods. But it's really important to think for just a minute about the way that we phrase these inherent tensions. Where there are and will always be inherent tensions between autonomy and other goods, we often feel these tensions in the context of our work as a tension between you and me, as a tension between the patient and me. And sometimes, often, that gets phrased as a tension between autonomy and paternalism, where there's either one of two outcomes. Either the patient gets what they want, and that's the autonomy result, and that's good, or there's the paternalism result where the physician gets what they want. And ethics conversations that are framed in this way become really non-productive and collapse the whole conversation of how we adjudicate different goods to this simple tug of war. And the easiest example of this, which isn't, you know, which is more common in family practice than emerges, is the sort of anti-vaccination movement. It's actually very great that you guys are here today. <laughs> um, because people who are really like the anti-vaccination movement have the sort of notion of any interaction with a physician. They want to get their freedom to do what they want, and they see any recommendation of a physician as a sort of power grab that's potentially manipulative or coercive. And so the necessary tension between autonomy and other goods, when it's framed as the tension between different people in this tug of war, collapses the conversation and become, can become profoundly unhelpful. Instead of considering together with patients how we adjudicate with different goods, it, goods, it can become seen as, again, this tug of war between different people. So what do we do with that? First of all, and I think this is the, the most critical piece, it's important to frame the question in terms of trust. And I always say this whenever I talk or write sort of in this area. Any dichotomy between autonomy and paternalism is always transcended in a relationship of trust. Because it is true, as I said in the dilemma section, that the same action can be cast as paternalistic or as profoundly caring. And the only difference is whether or not the patient trusts you. And we all know this. This connects to a sort of a basic psychological insight that the people who are the closest to us, our good friends and the people we value, are the people who can tell us things that we don't want to hear or call us out or those kinds of things. And we take those words as care Whereas if a stranger said those things to us, we would think they were a jerk. People who we trust can tell us things that are different than our expectations or what we want, and we listen to them because we believe that they care about us. And this points to a primary ethical responsibility for physicians as being experts at trust building. And part of the reason why I'm so excited about medical ethics and also so excited about emergency medicine is that emergency medicine is ground zero for this kind of a project because we meet strangers all day long who are scared and in pain and often in very vulnerable positions. And what we have to do over the course of short interactions is find ways to build tr trust with them, sorry, such that they will hear our recommendations, not as paternalism, but as an expression of care for them, which is, of course, how we intend it. And so I think this is an important framing as we approach these difficult conversations and our ethical responsibilities in them, to start with the trust building. And again, this connects to the sort of ethics as a broader project and a practice, 
and not just sort of how do you solve the rock and hard place puzzles when you get there. And I think placing a primary emphasis on this trust building project is a critical way of making our ethics work for us in the context of these type of interactions. So uh, just a few quick thank yous to Dr. Sensum for organizing the rounds. The Ransom Foundation was a bunch of uh, rich golfer guys who helped fund my study in St. Andrews, which is really nice of them. And Dr. Perry was my uh, supervisor in St. Andrews. So there's a boatload of references, and I will take any questions if you have them. I probably can't phrase it as uh, eloquently as Dr. Eber, but basically she was saying that in sort of bread and butter situations, that project of trust building can be easier, but when people have had previous negative experiences or when there's this sort of inherent distrust when they start, um, is there any sort of strategies to approach patients like that? Is that a reasonable summary of what you said? Yeah, I think, um, you know, obviously St. Paul's, we, we do see those kinds of, kinds of things. I think one thing that I try to do is just try to sort of name that elephant in the room with the patient where if they say, like, I know, my, I know I need antibiotics, I know it's cellulitis, and I'm saying, I don't think it's cellulitis, I don't think you need antibiotics right now, is to sort of try to, like, all, do the education stuff, but also to name that tension and to say, you know, I, I know maybe it feels like tense and like I'm not giving you what you want, but really what I see here is a conflict between what sort of the, the evidence says is, is good for you and what you want. And I want to help figure this out together. And it's like that sort of trying to reshift it from like you versus me to like you and me trying to evaluate the situation together. And I think that's like, that's not always going to work. And I think the other things that go a long way is, you know, like juice and sandwiches and friendly hellos and like all those kind of things that, um, that everyone, everyone knows. But I think that's what I really try to do is like shift, um, yeah, is try to shift it from again to like you versus me tug of war to like, yes, there are going to be tensions between different goods, but it's something that hopefully we can engage together and not butting heads. Does that help at all? Any other questions, comments? Frank? Yeah, thanks, thanks for a really good talk in an area we don't get that often. One of the things I haven't seen yet, but I've heard a couple of colleagues say, is uh, requests, especially at this hospital, for MAID. Now, <clears throat> I don't think it's going to happen in the emergency department very often, but obviously this brings up a huge bunch of medical issues. We've just had a private member's bill introduced in the Alberta legislature about this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. What kind of ethical framework can be used for, like, if I can come in at 2 in the morning and ask for this? I don't know how to respond, to be honest with you. Any, any tips? Yeah, and this is, a, this is a really difficult one more broadly. I think, um, you know, Aristotle said that, you know, like I said at the beginning, that the ends of, method, ends of medical ethics is health. But we in the past, like, 50 or 100 years have taken on this role of medicine as helping with this role of good dying, which means that the, like, primary teleology, the way with which we approach the ends of what we do, shifts at some point along the way between seeking patient's health to seeking this much more like vague idea of what good dying means. And I think uh, if you've read Being Mortal by Atul Gawande, he talks a lot about that in a way that's more eloquent, eloquent than I could in this sort of relatively new project and taking on these kind of responsibilities in medicine. Um, I think obviously with, with the made conversation, like Practically, this is something that's very rapidly evolving and something that we're not going to see in the emergency department anytime soon. Um, 
I tend to think that, you know, our role in that situation is to really listen to a good and then connect the patient on with someone else. Um, yeah, and, and that's that's part of the, like, rapidly evolving thing. In in um, BC, the, like, palliative care access is, is pretty good here, and so connecting to someone from those teams is, is a good step, but certainly those kinds of things in the emergency department isn't something that, um, for the most part, we'll be seeing anytime soon. Any other questions? Awesome. Thanks a lot. Oh, I'll leave my computer. Yeah. How do I uh, get mine up here? Yeah. It's not used to that. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and how do I advance it? So I think. Yeah, spacebar will work, or you can use the arrows to okay. forward and back. Oh, sorry, in here. No worries. Oh, there you go. <clears throat> okay, uh, thanks. I'm going to dumb it down a bit, and I will not be quoting Aristotle. <laughs> and I will not say the word teleology more than once. So. Uh, so I'm just going to talk to you about five things that uh, we need to know about sepsis. It's sort of a moving target. There's a lot of literature coming out in this area. Basically, I'm going to talk about um, just a b brief bit on background. Some of the definitions, because there was a sepsis three consensus paper that came out in uh, almost four years ago now, and it sort of changed the definitions of sepsis, and emergency medicine is not quite sure what to do with that. Um, I'm just gonna talk really briefly about sepsis protocols, and I'm gonna talk equally briefly about lactate and its role in sepsis in terms of diagnosis and some special situations where lactate interpretation is is a little different. And I'm going to spend probably 10, 12 minutes on uh, three studies that we've done at St. Paul's looking at blood cultures in sepsis and septic shock. And you go, how boring is that? Three studies? Can you just do one? But they're all sort of interrelated uh, some, somehow. So I'll put in a plug for the Emergency Medicine Network. Uh, you, you know, there's some great, yeah, Jim's happy. Everyone should be a member, and I think probably most of you are, but if you're not, get on it. Uh, right now, just for physicians, physicians, but I think that's changing, is that correct? Um, um, to be, you, you can access all the information without being a member. To be a member, okay. to have a conversation, you have, you, have, you have to be a physician in BC. Yeah. Okay, so there's a ton of clinical resources up there, including some on sepsis. Uh, there's many, many clinical to topics up there. So, you know, join, uh, use it. It's a, it's a great resource. Um, so what we won't talk about today, I mean, like I said, it's a huge area, sepsis, and not really amenable to a 25-minute talk. Uh, but there's some cool stuff out there with this vitamin C protocol, the Merrick protocol, uh, where he's had some uh, impressive uh, reduction mortality in people with septic shock. We won't talk about that. Plasmolite, balanced fluids. Uh, that's a thing. We're doing it now, I think, at probably at most of the hospitals uh, in Vancouver. You know, after a couple of liters, we're talking about balanced fluids. There's a whole reason for that, and there's some research to support it. Dave Sweet gave a great talk uh, at Provincial Grand Rounds last February where he went over a lot of this stuff, and I believe that's available somewhere online. Um, but, you know, we won't talk too much about that. There's some new drugs out there, and, of course, sepsis drugs have a notorious reputation for failing after initial promise. So not going to be talking about that. Uh, just from background perspective, it's, it's a huge problem. Uh, it's getting worse as people age and live with more comorbidities. It's probably about 20 to 30,000 deaths annually in, uh, in Canada, uh, 4. billion dollars, sorry, uh, $24 billion spent in the U.S. on it. And as you know, someone like Andy Kessler will tell you, Sepsis is actually a bigger problem in resource-poor settings than it is in developed countries. So a huge problem globally. In terms of, of definitions, um, yeah, this is, this is concerning. This came out about yeah, almost, uh, almost four years ago and sort of changed the definitions of sepsis. And it was a problem, like, as a, for a clinician, not so much because we didn't adopt it right away. Uh, but as a researcher, it was an issue because all of a sudden these definitions have changed. We're using the old SERS-based definition. There's this brand shiny new definition out there, and wow, we missed the boat because, well, it's not really sepsis anymore what you're talking about. Um, you know, so our sort of reaction was like, say what? You know, new definition. This is all like very uh, 
very confusing at the time. And, you know, most of us, all of us, I would think, are used to these SERS based definitions um, where you have to have one, uh, two or four, uh, more of these four criteria. So temperature, high or low, uh, respiratory rate, high, uh, heart rate greater than 90. Um, what's the last one? A white blood cell count, which is often when we're talking about trying to screen people and triage people, uh, we, we replace that with mental status. Uh, so all this stuff can be, can, can be sort of um, abstracted at when someone's triaged and then presumed or known infection. That's what we're used to and that's what we've been using. Now, in fact, this SOFA definition is a sequential organ failure assessment score. It's a physiologic score, like a, almost like a mini Apache. Not exactly. I'm not going to go over it because that's more sort of ICU, but what the sepsis three consensus conference or position said was that we want something that is usable at the bedside. So rather than having to know what someone's PCAO2 is or whatever measurement, we want something that's clinical and applicable at the bedside, on the wards, in the emergency department, wherever. And it's really only got three criteria, as you see up here. It's got respiratory rate greater than 22, um, change in mental status, and then a systolic blood pressure less than 100. So temperature, as you see, is not even in there anymore, which is a little bit counterintuitive when you're thinking sepsis, thinking infections. Um, now, the problem with this as a screening tool, so I'm not talking so much about a definition now, but as a screening tool, is, you know, what do you think about a respiratory rate greater than 22? So in an emergency department, a busy emergency department, how do we get respiratory rate? Well, count for six seconds times by 10, count for 10 seconds times by six, whatever. It's essentially a random number generator. And if you, and this is no reflection on the nurses, because actually physicians are probably worse if we try and estimate it, but it's one of those things that is very, very unreliable. Um, you know, if, if, it's, if the rest rate is not 4 or 40, it's <clears throat> excuse me, going to be 16 to 20 or 12 to 20 maybe. Um, so, so that's not reliable. And if you did a kappa on this, it would be terrible, right? Similarly, change in mental status. First of all, it implies you know what their baseline mental status is, which isn't always the case. But that is somewhat subjective too, whether you use AVPU, Glasgow Coma Scale, whatever it is, it's it's one of those things that um, is is uh, rife with you know sort of overlap. If you do that and apply it to a patient, and I do it, we might get a different number. So when two out of your three criteria for a screening tool are unreliable, it's going to be a bad screening tool. So and and in emergency medicine, when we screen for something or when we do a diagnostic test, what is it we really care about primarily in terms of diagnostic? test characteristics, well, we care about sensitivity. We don't want to miss anything, right? We don't want the false negative. The false positive is embarrassing, but the false negative, say if you had a scenario where a woman wasn't so obviously pregnant, had a vaginal bleed, you need your pregnancy test to be really good and to pick up the woman who's going to be pregnant because that changes everything in terms of your differential diagnosis management, et cetera, et cetera. So really sensitivity is, is king in that setting or in the emergency department setting. And in fact, there was a group out of Ottawa that studied this. What they did is they looked, they did a head-to-head -head comparison, um, and what they looked at it was a meta-analysis of 38 studies with almost 400,000 people just looking at QSOFA, sort of back calculating QSOFA and SIRS on, on a bunch of patients in ICUs, on the wards, and in emergency departments. And basically what they came up with is that SOFA, QSOFA has actual, actually better accuracy in terms of area under the curve, but much poorer sensitivity, which like I said, is what we care about in the emergency department. So that's, um, that's an important thing to think about. Uh, there was this, you know, a lot of sort of, uh, press generated and commentaries that led us to the editor about this, like why are we flogging a dead horse? Let's just use SIRS, it works, we know it. Why this new definition? Uh, this is by actual, uh, actually that Merrick guy who did the Merrick protocol. Um, I don't know if any of you use this site, Rebel EM. Anyone look at this site? Really good site for 
blogs, for reviews of uh, primarily research papers, but also now they're getting into clinical stuff. It's fantastic, and and they whoever does the reviews, they they make sure that they have a a good methodological background. I've looked at many of them, and they're usually bang on in terms of how they assess research papers and potentially practice changing papers. So I, I encourage you to uh, to check it out. But they had a good discussion about this particular study. And, and what they came up with was basically the QSOFA is really not very good. And if you look at the numbers in green uh, for SIRS versus QSOFA in all of the settings, whether it's on the wards, ICU, or in the emergency department, that the sensitivity is going to be way better with SIRS than it is with QSOFA. So if any of you were worried that we're changing the definition of sepsis or we're changing the screening tools, um, that's not happening anytime soon. Probably will never happen because it's just not as sensitive a test. There are these uh, newer systems, algorithms for looking at, uh, for, for looking at, you know, trying to pick up sepsis patients, such as news that we're actually using at St. Paul's, I think just in a sort of research perspective right now. Um, but it's been around for a, a while in England. And it basically has more components. Now, some of the same components, like respiratory rate, which are unreliable, um, but it has other ones. So because it's got more components, it's going to be more reliable. So what about some of these new systems like Cerner? Cerner's coming, and that's sort of how we all feel. Just put a diaper on your head and uh, avoid. But um, So it does have this thing, and I think anyone who did the modules ha knows about these the, uh, there's a program in there that like, uh, has sort of an early warning for sepsis or potentially septic based on presenting complaint, I believe, and uh, vital signs, because now vital signs are in there, which is going to be incredible for, you know, for, for research purposes, an easy link to vital, vital signs. It also has this lights on sub program that will allow you to pull out cases of, of sepsis and, and probably other clinical diagnoses as well. Um, so, so that's something that you know, may work really well for us. They've looked at these automated uh, systems for picking up people with sepsis in other settings. There was a Cochrane review back in uh, 2018 or just a year ago uh, looking at ICUs, three randomized trials where they got an automated system uh, versus a paper system for people who develop sepsis in the intensive care unit. Now, that's a little different because they're not septic going in but they're at risk for ventilator-associated pneumonia, so on and so forth. And then how was it in picking, in terms of picking up septic patients, as opposed to the nurse going, this guy spiked a temp. Um, and and the, the studies were of such poor quality that uh, they really couldn't say a lot. That, you know, the automated system is better than the paper system, but that's something we could certainly look at with regard to Cerner. You know, one of the things, I'm actually going to miss SCM because it's a great program. It served us well over the years. One of the things I used to laugh at is at the end of my shift when I'd be sort of getting my, my billings together and so on, um, I would, you'd have to punch in what date, what site, and then your name. And there's actually another Stenstrom in here, John David, right, who ends up being my uncle, who's been dead for 30 years. He used to be a CVT surgeon primarily in Victoria, but he came over to St. Paul's to do cases, and he's still in there. And it's funny, when I punch him in, he'd be like seeing patients still and more than Cala does, for instance. <laughs> so I'm uh, going to miss that. Um, so just to talk really briefly about sepsis protocols, uh, we do have a protocol in place. This is, these are old data, but I mean, you could extrapolate them to now 10 years later. Um, they have a really profound impact on mortality for sepsis, morbidity, however you want to measure it. Uh, number needed to treat of five, which is like huge, um, compared to say thrombolytics in, in STEMI where the number needed to treat is 50. So that's something that's, you know, we do have a sepsis protocol in place. It's, it used to be up in the trauma room. It, it's around, it's floating around. Um, but most of us know it by now. And I think the difference is back in the day, 10, 12 years ago, sepsis was not as well known an entity as it is now. It used to be, oh, there's some tachycardic febrile guy in the waiting room. I guess, well, I don't, wanna, I don't know what's going on with him. I'll see someone else. So that's all changed. Now we know about it. It gets paged overhead, CTAS level 2 sepsis. Nurses order the blood work up front usually. So things have changed. Um, 
And what was shown is that no protocol, so initially early goal-directed therapy was a big deal. And, you know, that seemed to be something that could decrease mortality by, by half almost. And, in fact, it's um, been shown that when you can uh, compare it to these other protocols that don't necessarily include early goal-directed therapy, there's no difference. See the survival curves there and point estimates of the uh, uh, relative risk, absolute risk reduction, so on, are, are pretty similar. So in our protocol, which used to have early goal-directed therapy, no longer includes early goal directed therapy uh, as part of it and and by that I mean giving blood transfusions when the hemoglobin is just a little low like a hundred we never do that anymore the ICU doesn't do that uh, dobutamine which might be a thing in the ICU but we've never given it or never give it in the emergency department um, and then looking at mixed venous oxygenation. That's not something that we do typically or ever. Rob, just a couple other developments. Mixed venous has got replaced by lactate clearance a number of years ago in a study by Klein. And now, I think we did this for Journal Club, um, it is now getting replaced by cap refill in a study by Fernandez. So it, it, it turns out the individual components have been replaced, but they're still sort of there, just that we're using less and less invasive methods. Like, yeah. we put a central line on these guys anymore either, right? Yeah, and, and CVP, uh, we're doing by ultrasound, right? Yeah, exactly. Compressibility. Right. So, of the, it, but the thing is, the, the, we're still paying attention to the same things, just with in slightly different, less invasive, and less resource uh, important uh, ways. I remember all these guys used to get an art line right away. The Emerge Doc put them in. This isn't even that long ago. Nobody does that anymore either. So, this has all been overhauled really, really nicely. And the studies themselves have been quite elegant to prove that you don't really need to do this, you don't need to do this, and you can dial that back. Yeah, no, that's a good point. All right, thanks. And we got to, like, probably revamp our protocol to reflect that. So I'm just going to say a couple of things about lactate, because lactate clearance, I was shown a long time ago by one of River's students that, that if you um, clear your lactate within six hours, has a short half-life, that that's actually a really good prognostic factor. If you don't within six hours, your risk of mortality goes way up. So we do pay attention to lactate. And there's some certain clinical circumstances, medications specifically, where lactate interpretation becomes a little bit difficult. And, and just a couple of things. One thing is that lactate does not equal lactic acid. And sepsis is associated with a lactic acidosis, or should be, if you believe that it's a hypoperfusion state. And that's why you're generating lactate. And it generates acid, too. So, in fact, lactate can actually act as a buffer. And in an exercise setting, you know, Lance Armstrong or triathletes and all this, they, you know, they, they say, oh, I got these sore muscles, so all this lactic acid. Well, it's not. And, and lactate can actually be a buffer, so it can raise pH. So why do we care? Um, specifically, I mean, because we're dealing with lactates all the time when we're talking about sepsis, but we see a lot of patients on metformin. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard from residents, um, you know, so, oh, you know, he's got this lactic acidosis because he's on metformin or she's on metformin. And in fact, uh, metformin cannot cause lactic acidosis, full stop. Okay, never ever. It's sort of said as, you know, as a fenformin, the predecessor, and metformin, oh, that's a risk, but, but it's actually, it's not. If you look at huge toxic ingestions, uh, sometimes they go on to develop lactic acidosis if they've taken 100, 150 times the usual dose. But what can happen is if people get into renal failure, and again, metformin doesn't cause renal failure, um, then the two of them combined for different reasons can cause lactic acidosis. So the point being, there was actually a study that looked at this a number of years ago, that when the patient's on metformin, they can have an elevated lactate for sure, but it can't make them profoundly have a profound lactic acidosis. Okay, so if they have a lactic acidosis, look elsewhere for the cause. Don't chalk it up to the metformin because that would not be the case unless they're in renal failure. Um, in fact, this study actually showed that they, people on metformin had a much lower mortality from sepsis. So you're taking people with bad protoplasm, diabetics, presumably, um, that actually had uh, a lower, and they, they weren't trying to say that, oh, it's protective and maybe we should be using it in sepsis, but they just said that, you know, they have other reasons if they have a lactic acidosis, it is not due to metformin. So look elsewhere. Um, yeah. 
So that's basically the message there. Now, what about alcohol? Because we see a lot of people with alcohol on board who have an elevated lactate because the liver will process um, alcohol preferentially before uh, it will process lactate, and, and then lactate does uh, go through the liver. Um, and that's a little tricky because you can be, because of pyruvate metabolism, that I won't bore you with, but uh, you, you can be a little bit acidotic from having uh, alcohol on board, depending on, you know, how you're acclimatized to drinking, are you a regular drinker or not. But we've had a bunch of sepsis cases that if I go through our, you know, 1,500 person database where if they've had a lactate and, you know, maybe been febrile, that sort of things have been chalked up to, oh, maybe it's withdrawal or maybe it's the alcohol, and they've actually had delayed administration of fluids and antibiotics and, and some morbidity and even some mortality, because, well, with these, due to the delay or not, it's hard to say, but easy to chalk up stuff to the, to the drunk patient. Like, oh, they look a little sweaty, let's get a temp, and wow, well, they're febrile. So be, uh, be a little careful of those patients with alcohol on board uh, and, and potentially uh, septic. Yeah? Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. I mean, certainly anything that impairs liver function will impair lactate clearance. So all those things about zero and six hour lactate clearance kind of go out the window. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it can, but you know, it's not going to be, it could be three or four. It's not going to be eight unless they're in renal failure, they're getting acid out. That's, that's I think, that what I was trying to get across. They, they usually will, and in that previous study I talked about, they actually had uh, an increased, uh, increased lactate, like baseline. Mm -hmm. So that's, and, and sometimes you see that, someone comes in on metformin, for, and you know, come, because it's on the RMP, they, you see their lactate and it's, it's like two, which is you know, normal, but it's high normal, and, you, and you know, we just kind of ignore that if it's not in the context of something where you'd expect the lactate or maybe think the lactate would be up. Dan, I'm glad you asked that because, you know, it wouldn't be a talk without at least a couple of Dan Callum pictures. Dan uh, in Nicaragua, he's a real humanitarian. Uh, he's down there helping people and that, and he's this little kid he took care of. But this is actually the kid before he saw him. This kid made the mistake of dissing his latest book, and Dan took exception to that, and that's what he looked like after. <laughs> it's not, not the real humanitarian I think he is. Uh, so just don't diss his books. So in terms of uh, switch gears now and just talk for maybe 10 minutes about blood cultures and um, I'll just go over this, the blood culture. I call it a paradox and, and maybe you'll see why. Um, you know, black, uh, blood culture infections, bloodstream infections have a 14, 15% mortality. We care about them. Um, you know, antibiotic stewardship is a big thing in patients, if they have a positive blood culture, we want to make sure we're treating the right bug and then tailor it to make it as narrow spectrum as possible in terms of resistance. Um, all the protocols, like every protocol in existence, you know, says you need to get blood cultures before giving antibiotics. And actually in the United States, it's used as a quality marker. So hospitals will get funding or have funding taken away based on their percentage of patients that have blood cultures before antibiotics. And then the second piece of that is how quickly they get in the antibiotics. And they're sort of at odds with each other because sometimes we delay antibiotics for blood cultures, not uncommonly, because they have to be done twice. Sometimes their patients are perfectly shut down, they're hard to get samples from. Um, so there are reasons why. And then if we have to wait for the blood cultures to get the antibiotic, that can, that can precede or cause time delays, I should say. So this is the surviving sepsis guidelines I think that most of us are familiar with and have heard about. Uh, there are Canadian equivalents that I helped develop back in 2008 and 2013. Um, they, uh, you know, all of these protocols say blood cultures before antibiotics. That's sort of one of the high-grade evidence supporting that um, that, that uh, come, come out of these protocols. Um, you know, we have a protocol here at St. Paul's, like I said, and we evaluated this and uh, you know, but all of these protocols say that you need to get antibiotics before. Now, the difference is, is 
a little different in the wording the, on, the, on your right is the surviving sepsis um, guidelines and they say get your antibiotic uh, antibiotics in within an hour but before that do cultures whereas for the CAPE guidelines we said you know get the antibiotics in within an hour that's an actually really unrealistic goal and is is not doesn't happen even with some of the sickest septic patients if you look it's like probably less than 50 percent that get antibiotics in within an hour so it's a little unrealistic and some groups had issues with this um, but what we said in the CAPE guideline was that you know you should actually try and get microbial cultures before but don't delay your antibiotics just to get the blood culture. Now the interesting thing was, is like, and again, I'll just explain that the time to antibiotics in six septic patients is a big predictor of mortality. It goes up in a linear, maybe even exponential fashion, you know, as time goes on, if you delay antibiotics. So that's, that's important. Um, and, and like I said, antibiotics can be delayed by waiting for cultures. So it's, it's again, sort of a, a needs that are sort of going head to head against each other. Now the reason it's a bit of a paradox is that in the emergency department, blood cultures are only positive about 10% of the time, depending. They have a pretty high false positive rate. So of those 10%, 40 to 50% can be false positives. So it's just a contaminant or organism, even though we take care when we draw them and so on and so forth. There are significant costs associated with this. This is a paper from 30 years ago almost, showing that people who had false uh, positive blood cultures, stayed in hospital longer, got more unnecessary antibiotics, more tests, and developed hospital-acquired infections, infections more, more often. So pretty big deal. They're not a benign thing. They cost $40 a set and we do them twice. So 80 bucks per person. We order about three to three and a half thousand just out of the emergency department uh, every year at St. Paul's. And if it's a positive culture, even if it's a false positive, it has to be speciated, and that costs $200. Now, there's some tech technological advances that are changing and may bring that price down, but not for the time being. Blood cultures almost never alter management in terms of, you know, if you have an uncomplicated community-acquired pneumonia, you're going to treat the right bug. Um, you know, you're going to give them ceftriaxone, azithromycin, whatever you're using. Uh, pyelonephritis, and I've seen this many, many times in our, in our sepsis data set, the urine cultures will match the blood cultures if the blood cultures are positive. So if they have a positive urine culture, which they usually do if they have, you know, urosepsis, pyelonephritis, just treat those. Um, and this is a study by Eric Grant, Jim, many, many years ago, before my time, back from the 90s. I don't know if you remember that, Jim, but... Um, yeah, so it was Grant that spearheaded it, but he basically, and only presented an abstract, unfortunately, it was never written up, but showed that blood cultures in the emergency department setting are not really that helpful because they don't alter your management. And, and it's interesting that they actually took, in this study, took injection drug users too, which can have all sorts of funny bugs and, and so on and so forth. And even in those cases, rarely helpful in terms of changing management. Helpful in terms of reassuring ourselves, but so is a lot of stuff in medicine. Um, so if you look at all of these protocols, like I said, they recommend that antibiotics be drawn, or sorry, uh, uh, blood cultures be drawn before antibiotics. And this was never evidence-based. So we did this study, Dave Sweet and Matt Cheng, uh, seven places uh, across Canada and the U.S., a huge uh, hospital system down in Phoenix participated. Uh, McGill was in on it. Um, and what we did is we looked at, you know, do you really need to get cultures before giving antibiotics? So it was published a couple of months ago with a fair bit of fanfare, more than I thought would be necessary, actually, because it just seems intuitive. But if you give antibiotics, of course, you know, your, your yield rate of cultures is going to go down. That just makes sense, but it never been proven, never been evidence-based. So this is published in Annals of Internal Medicine. And Basically, what we did is we took all emergency department patients um, with sepsis and then looked for the sickest one. So systolic blood pressure low, less than 90, or a lactate greater than 4. And we did blood cultures on all of them before, gave antibiotics usually within two hours, and then did blood cultures after, within usually within like 90 minutes. And the outcome was being positive with a non-contaminant organism. And uh, our results are pretty striking that if the yield beforehand, uh, before getting antibiotics was 31% and after was 
19% with an absolute difference of 12% and a massive, massively small, small uh, p-value around that or very tight confidence interval. So meaning that you do need to get blood cultures before antibiotics. But remember I said that the positivity rate was about 10 to 12% in the emergency department, you know, when we do blood culture. So 90% negative, but what's with the 31% here? And the reason is, is we took the sickest of the six septic patients. So these are essentially septic shock, cryptic shock patients, right? And we had to exclude 90% of them that did not have these. So they're septic by, by the definition, the SERS definition we're using. They didn't have septic shock. They didn't have a lactate. So like I said, the take home point from this one is that in your emergency department patients with septic shock or an elevated lactate, get blood cultures rapidly and then give antibiotics rapidly. I think that stands. Now what about the other 90% of patients who don't meet these criteria and are not in septic shock where the yield is, so that's probably about 10%. Now, do you need blood cultures in all these people? And according to our protocol, according to most protocols out there, we are getting blood cultures. And this is why we're doing so many of them. There are guidelines out there, uh, Infectious Disease Society of America, you know, looking at, uh, you know, what cases you don't need blood cultures in and it ends up it's not all cases. There are certain situations where it's uh, lower risk. Um, and there are lots of clinical guidelines. There's a good decision rule out there. Uh, it's just not been widely used. It was developed in Philadelphia, I believe. believe. And the problem with decision rules is that oftentimes they're clunky. And this one uh, for, for getting blood cultures is actually really clunky. And it's just not something that we're going to be implementing. Because because it's so time sensitive, we go like, we need blood cultures, we need them now, get the antibiotics in. You know, there's this, sort of this rush. Um, Physician, physician gestalt uh, is, is awful, it's been looked at, and we cannot predict who's gonna have positive blood cultures. We're really bad at it. Um, so, you know, that led me to think about what about some of the biomarkers that are out there. There's all these fancy ones, stuff that I don't even know what they, what they mean. You know, there's one there, it's like in the, on the uh, your left-hand side, it's called rage. I want to measure someone's rage. Um, you know, what does that mean, right? But so ones that are familiar to us are CRP and procalcitonin. So procalcitonin is used a lot in the ICU setting. It's used a ton in the non-ICU settings over in Europe, interestingly, but not widely available here. So, so I, we looked at a bunch and, and a bunch of ones we already have, like if you take the white count and then you take the absolute neutrophil count over the lymphocyte, take a ratio, we looked at D-dimers, different things, and nothing really was a particularly good test to rule out or to rule in, you know, sepsis or potential bad outcomes. So I, I looked at C-reactive protein. Um, it's something we're all familiar with. It's been around for a long time. It is a fairly rapid response that if you have a stimulus, um, and because it's so intimately involved with the optimization of, of uh, bacteria, it will go up quite high. And we'll, all, we'll see, you know, the cellulitis patient with a bad cellulitis with a CRP of 200. And what does that mean? Well, they got a bad bacterial infection. Um, but it can also be used as a marker for, for uh, positive blood cultures. So we did this first study where we wanted to look at people uh, to try and predict bacteremia, and we used an a priori cutoff of uh, a CRP of 20 which is just based on a whole bunch of things, other literature out there. I, I won't go into the details, but just trust me that it seems like a reasonable cutoff. We didn't try moving the cutoff very much uh, because this is what had been used in other research. And we excluded people who are high risk. So septic shock, injection drug user, you know, had a procedure or admitted to hospital within the last couple of weeks and, um, or if they had an indwelling catheter. So we, we excluded the high risk people. And we came up with something like this where you screened 1,100 people, 230 of them were actually, uh, we, had, we excluded them because they had one of these, one of these issues. Um, and then we were left with 863 patients and who had a positivity rate of about 12%, but 20% of those, 12%, so 20 out of the 104 had false positive blood cultures. Um, they, they, you know, they weren't in septic shock when they came in. Some of them went on to develop septic shock, went to ICU, and some died. So this is like it's a moving target, right? And we all know that a sepsis person when they, or any disease for that matter, when they present at triage can change their course. Well, they get better, they get worse, so on. So you have to 
sort of reassess them. This is sort of what it looked like, and lots of numbers up here, but basically a sepsis, uh, sorry, a CRP of 20 missed only two patients of the true positives. So that was pretty interesting. And so the sensitivity was uh, 97% with a decent confidence interval about that. And if you looked at blood cultures that actually changed patient management, well, that goes up to 100% because the two that were that we missed was one was a urosepsis that had E. coli, I believe, in the in the uh, uh, urine, and the other one was a post-op uh, prostate biopsy, but four weeks because it would have been two weeks we would have excluded him, um, and I think this is just a brewing infection that just developed into sepsis. So pretty good, uh, pretty good numbers there. Uh, this was presented in abstract form with smaller numbers because we've sort of been building up the data set. It's just going to. It's submitted it to uh, BMJ infectious diseases. Haven't heard back yet. Um, but uses a rollout test based on this for uh, non-high risk sepsis patients. You can avoid blood cultures if their CRP is less than 20. I think that's a completely reasonable thing to do and and safe. Um, and we would have avoided blood cultures in 30 to 40 percent of our patients. And it would have been a huge cost savings associated with that. I, I don't know offhand, but it's, it's lots in the hundreds of thousands, you know, just at St. Paul's. So something to think about. Now, usually for diagnostic tests, when we think about the impact of a diagnostic test, we, you know, have your two-by-two two table, you know, we spit out these numbers like I had on the previous page, and that's, you know, how we say, okay, this is a good diagnostic test. It's not. It's a good rule-out test. It's not. Um, but how do you actually look at the impact of a test or measure that? Well, the best way is to do a randomized trial. Um, you know, you can do before after implementation is another way to do it. But we actually did a randomized trial. It's actually just been finished. We're looking at the data now. Um, and what it was is multi-center, well, because it was St. Paul's and Mount St. Joseph's. And we were looking at the effect of the knowledge of CRP level by the physician on blood culture ordering uh, behavior. So again, same patients, low risk sepsis, no septic shock, injection drug use, um, untreated HIV or immunocompromised, splenectomy, ca vascular catheter. Is anyone where you really want to know if they have bacteremia or not? Um, the procedure was to take all of these people and do a point of care C-reactive protein on them once they agreed to participate in the study. And it was actually a big hassle. We had to get this special exemption from, uh, from uh, Health Canada to use this machine because it's not been licensed in Canada. But we finally got through it after about nine or 10 months. And everyone got a CRP when they hit, the, well, basically signed the consent form. So um, it's a pretty easy thing. You take a drop of blood, you put it on under one of these cassettes, it goes in and it analyzes, it gives you a quantitative measure of the C-reactive protein uh, value in about three minutes, three and a half minutes. And then what we did was, so everyone had that done, uh, then we randomized the physician now to find out if they're getting the CRP knowledge or not. So half, uh, half the patients that we told the doc what the CRP value was, then they were free to do whatever they want. If they wanted to order blood cultures or not, um, and the other half, we didn't tell them. And then they did their usual blood work, ordered blood cultures if they wanted or not, and see sort of where, where that all sort of landed. Um, many outcomes, safety outcomes obviously are important. You don't want to be missing things and have people dying because you didn't, you know, get, get the right antibiotic, you were treating the wrong bug. Uh, but just suffice to say that they were, I'm still analyzing this data, but uh, they were all the same. Uh, our primary outcome was if blood cultures were ordered or not. And in fact, if docs knew what the CRP level was, they, uh, on, on average, ordered 30% fewer blood cultures. Now, it wasn't always based on the CRP value because, you know, they, we told them, said, yeah, you know, 20 is sort of a cutoff, but that's not been proven anywhere. Do what you want. So they might see a cellulitis with a CRP of 150, say, yeah, you know what, it's a cellulitis. They don't need blood cultures. And they're probably right. Or they might see someone who looks really unwell or there's something gestalt that they don't like about the patient, the CRP is 12, they could order them. It was totally up to them. But it was a real, uh, like in real time study in terms of 
the decision to order blood cultures or not was left that way. It's not like, well, okay, they didn't want blood cultures, but we ordered them anyway. Um, it was, if they didn't want to order them, they didn't order them. So we looked at these safety outcomes, um, and it ends up that, yeah, the ordering rate was lower. Uh, there were fewer false positives, which is good, right? Pa false positives are bad. And there were more true positives. So the yield was higher. And if they didn't have a blood culture order, it was important to make sure they weren't bacteremic and they weren't treating the right, the, the right bug with antibiotics, if they even gave antibiotics. Um, but no subjects died or went to ICU or presented within a month to local emergency departments. Um, and the, the point of care uh, analyzer was actually quite accurate until it got over 200. Then there were some disparities because all these patients had a, um, a lab CRP done as well. So we concluded that, you know, in patients that come in with sepsis, so they meet all the criteria, but they're not in shock, they don't have risk factors that make you worry, and again, it's gonna be clinical judgment is gonna overrule everything with, with this. Um, if they're not high risk, then it's probably safe and effective to do a CRP, because those, those point of care analyzers went away. Our lab hates point of care, and it'll never sort of gain foothold in here beyond a pregnancy test. Um, but just order a CRP. There's good rapid turnaround time, usually within less than an hour. And if it's less than 20, and they don't meet any of these other criteria, you don't need to order blood cultures. And you're safe in doing that. And it'll be published at some point in the next six to eight months, hopefully, and, and you'll have something to back you up when you go to court. Um, right. Um, Matt? I mean, if we're going to wait for the CRP to come back before we order blood cultures, they'll likely be started on antibiotics before we order the blood culture then. So it isn't going to drop our... Yeah, so that's true. Before. But then these are people, like I said, because they're not high risk, when you're assessing them, uh, they, you can actually wait. So the people who benefit from rapid antibiotics are the ones who, when they hit the door, their, their uh, systolic pressure is low. Give them a fluid bolus and it doesn't respond or they have a lactate greater than four. Those are the people that you really need rapid antibiotics. In fact, there's one paper out there showing that if you treat all these sepsis patients with rapid antibiotics, that there's some downside to that. You know, if you treat them all like, like they're all in septic shock when they're not, it's a 28-year-old with a strep throat who has an appropriate heart rate of 105 for their fever of 40, um, you know, the, the, the reality is, is, you know, you don't need to do that and there can be some downsides. So this, these, it's a moving target, right? And that's the problem with the whole definition of sepsis because it's a syndromic thing, really hard to, um, to you know, get a good definition. And that's why this sort of change to another definition that's actually a crappier definition isn't really helping anyone because it just introduces confusion. Um, so I'd say those people that you know, are not in septic shock, injection drug users, and all the rest, that you, you can wait. You can wait that hour to get the CRP back. Hey, CRP is 15. I'm not going to order a blood culture. You may still treat them with antibiotics, but they don't need a blood culture because you're going to treat the right thing. Um, so anyway, I think that's probably enough about sepsis, so I'll just wrap up there. Uh, so just to summarize, there are no new useful ED screens, especially QSOFA, for uh, sepsis and, and uh, SIRS and infection works, and we're going to stick with it. Metformin doesn't cause lactic acidosis. Look around for another cause if they have that. So alcohol can, uh, but again, you need to be careful with these patients because just going through sort of anecdotally through our database, there's a lot of drunk people and some of our regular drinkers, um, you know, that have been like had treatment delayed because everything's been chalked up to their alcohol level, their lactate and so on. So blood cultures before antibiotics in rapidly uh, and rapidly in six septic patients and they're also, blood cultures are not benign and they're expensive. So in patients who aren't so sick or don't meet those criteria, um, you know, you can avoid them if the CRP is less than 20. So I will stop there and take any questions. Thank you. Eric. That was really good. Thanks, Rob. Um, in Cerner, there, on the dashboard, there is an alert for the septic patient, the nurse. And there, there, um, I think the alert is turned off for providers that says, hey, you've got a patient with sepsis. Um, uh, um, at least, and there is functionality within Cerner to help prompt you go, to go through uh, a tree of antibiotic selection based on the condition called sepsis advisor. That was turned off because 
Cerner built that for us and didn't do a really good job, so we had to turn it off. And Is it coming back? Or? It will be coming back when okay. they fix it. And what about lights on? What's yeah, that? Uh, th that's, that's an analytics tool that we have only partially implemented. Okay. And more work on that. I, I have a scenario, and I want your uh, uh, impression. So let's say someone in the, who's 40 comes in with a high fever and maybe they're a little bit uh, tachycardic, but their blood pressure is stable. You give them some fluid, their lactate is normal. Uh, they have a bit of a high white count, let's say it's 15, and you decide they're not sick enough to stay. You, you've ordered blood cultures. I don't know if a CRP was entered, maybe not. And then um, you, they go home. Uh, you you want to send them home. Should you give them antibiotics before or not? Huh, that's that's a tough question, and that's uh, you know I guess it's going to vary from person, uh, patient to patient, from doc to doc, depending on how risk averse you are. Uh, but certainly, you know, it's happened so many times where you know w when we used to, now Michaela does it, but we used to trace down blood cultures, and this person has no fixed address, they have no phone, they have no way to get in touch with them. Um, I think if it's someone like that, I would have a lower threshold for just giving, a, not based on anything, but just giving them a dose of some antibiotic, um, you know, especially if there's some of our downtown east side population because there is risk in there. And if I look at, again, who comes back with a positive uh, blood culture, injection drug users are, are way overrepresented at, at, at any age. You know, they don't usually make it to 70, but, you know, for, it, it, you know if you age match them, they probably five or six times li yeah. more likely to have. Well, that's uh, the right problems. answer, I think. Not that it would have made a difference, but this is a medical legal case that wasn't mine, but I participated in. And the patient came back 16 hours later in septic shock and from a variety of other complications ended up with uh, bilateral uh, foot and hand amputations as a result of their in invasive group A strep. They weren't given an antibiotic at the time of discharge. and it, this was a long time ago uh, before uh, a lot of sepsis stuff, but it, I, I find that that's a common problem that we face, what yeah. to do with those patients. Yeah, and just, and just as well. when I look at some of the highest CRPs are associated with Streptococcus A, for whatever reason, because it's encapsulated or uh, whatever, you know, it tends to really provoke a, a strong CRP response and rapidly, you know, six hours or less. You're advocating on all those, you know, all patients with a fever that we should be doing a CRP. Yeah, and it's actually part of our sepsis pathway, and part of the reason I was able to do this research is because when we, with Krista Witt and Julian way back when, developed the sepsis protocol, we put CRP in there because I was sort of thinking like, yeah, you know what, this might be an interesting research question. And so now if you go to our sepsis pathway, I don't know if it's true in, in Cerner, but uh, the one in SCM, it's CRP is right there with blood cultures and white blood cell count. and. You know, so it actually, you know, it wasn't, and, and in fact, they made a note of it. Sherry from Lionsgate made a note of it and is going to add it in. Question. Um, we, I'm wondering about the CRP correlation with the lab and the analyzer, um, not because we're going to get the analyzer and the eMERGE, but we did a couple of papers at Journal Club last looking at COPD um, and CRP point of care testing. I was just wondering, um, is it correlated? Is it the same units that we test in the lab? And mm -hmm. can we say that we can use the 20 value in our labs? Yeah, so so the ones we use that are from Allure, uh, which is, a, I think, a British company, but they do have an office in uh, in Ottawa. They, it was calibrated. Now, they use different calibration for down in the States when they're using, like, the SI units. But the um, uh, the, the units we had, it was, it was 20, and the correlation was quite good. It wasn't, so it wasn't perfect. Sometimes someone would be an 18 on the lab and a 22 on the analyzer, or vice versa. So, but it was, it was pretty tight. And once it got over 200, which at that point it doesn't really matter, but it was actually quite, it could be off by 50. But whether it's 150 or 250, you don't really care at that point. So it was actually quite, it was actually quite good. I'm going to actually analyze that and publish it in some lab journal that no one will ever read, but... Uh, <laughs> That's the plan. Any other questions? Hi, Rob. Um, your first point uh, mentioned not using QSOFA to identify sepsis. Is this something people are actually doing? Because my understanding of QSOFA is that it's strictly for non-ICU patients already with confirmed or suspected sepsis for predicting their risk of mortality, not for identifying them. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good point. I don't. So, so to my knowledge, no emergency departments have rushed to use it. But there was a lot of 
uh, consternation when it first came out. It's like, oh, okay, we better switch to this. And certainly from a research perspective, that was important. But, you know, clinically, you know, people sort of said like, oh, yeah, it's something new. It's this surviving sepsis, all these gurus of sepsis, really. Uh, we better latch on to this and we better do it. And then there was sort of this step back, like, well, wait a second, you know, what's the evidence for that? And then this actually this Ottawa study with 400,000 patients is sort of the nail in the coffin in terms of, not of the definition, but in terms of using it as a screening tool. So, but that's a good point. I don't think that anyone is, is using it yet. In, and But in, that was the initial plan. I don't know if they sort of developed it for that reason, but sort of as a screen, maybe it was never intended for that. It's hard to know what exactly what they were thinking. But yeah, so it's not been adopted and, you know, nor should it be. So good point. Okay, well, thanks. Maybe I'll stop there. And um, Cindy San is here from pharmacy, just going to talk to us briefly about... Oh, best possible medications. Okay, something related to Cerner, right? Okay, so thanks very much. While we're setting up, <laughs> my name is Cindy. I'm a pharmacist in Emerge at St. Paul's, and this is Mike. Um, he's my boss. Uh, he's the pharmacy manager at, uh, for clinical services at uh, uh, Lower Mainland Pharmacy Services, and this is Teresa. She's our medication reconciliation pharmacist at St. Paul's Hospital. Um, so Mike will be um, sort of presenting on the um, best possible medication history um, program that we are initiating come Cerner, go live, and um, yeah, why don't you take it away? All right, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sandstrom, for the time today for us to just uh, provide this little uh, update uh, on what we're doing. So some of you uh, working in uh, the St. Paul's Emerge or MSJ may have encountered some of our new staff that we've been training uh, for this best possible medication history component, which is a uh, part of Cerner. What I wanted to do was give you a brief update of, of this BPMH component and what our staff are doing kind of why they're doing it and are asked to you in terms of to um, just to try to help us flag patients for them to look. And so um, what is the best possible medication history? Um, I think you all take histories every day of patients. So what's different about a best possible medication history in Cerner? Um, the intent is that it's a, it's a thorough history taking of the medications the current uh, patients currently taking. This includes prescription, non-prescription medications, uh, herbal products, vitamins, and a description about how the patient takes the medications. And probably the more uh, challenging component that's been noted in Cerner is that um, it does take a lot of time to document this in the system itself, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Why is it important to capture this and to document it? Um, it's important because um, basically uh, the BPMH and Cerner is used as a source of truth. So essentially, um, other um, when a consultant service say comes to see a patient later on during the admission, uh, their consult note will be populated with the BPMH in terms of home medication list, for example. On discharge, it's also critically important for discharge medication reconciliation that this list of medications that's been documented as the best possible medication history is then used um, to basically help that reconciliation process on discharge, which will be a required organizational practice by Accreditation Canada the next time we go. So we're going to have to have um, this discharge med rec be implemented consistently. Um, 
and it's required um, uh, putting a BPMH in and uh, documenting it and doing med rec is required uh, for all patients being admitted to hospital and through select ambulatory care clinics. So the challenges, um, taking this thorough history and documenting it is time consuming. At the feedback we've heard is that this process, when done end to end, can take up to 35 to 40 minutes. Um, and so this has been a challenge and a concern uh, when implementing Cerner and having this kind of be like a um, a critical function of, of the system. And there's potential for this to create workload bottlenecks if, if um, prescribers are required to spend the time doing this and also doing the order entry part of documenting it. Um, definitely that would be a concern and it could delay admissions and flow through the system. So in order to try to address this challenge at Lionsgate Hospital, they hired five additional pharmacy staff to actually take these histories and document them in, this, in the system. System. And um, it has helped and certainly has helped that system uh, and uh, with allowing flow through the system. So we put in an ask um, to senior leadership in order to recognizing that this would be a challenge if we're required to do a BPMH for all patients and document it for all patients being admitted. Um, we wanted to get out ahead of this, so we were successful in getting um, some funding and support to hire pharmacy staff to do this work similar to what's being done at Lionsgate. And so essentially what we have at St. Paul's and um, and MSJ is we have uh, support in the emergency department at St. Paul's, support in the emergency department at MSJ, and also at the uh, pre-admission clinic, the surgical pre-admission clinic, which services both um, St. Paul's and MSJ. In terms of um, the schedule, so we will have a BPMH pharmacist at MSJ from 12 to 8 p.m., seven days a week. Um, those ti the timing of these, of, of these shifts has been determined based on when admissions occur and, um, at these sites. And then at St. Paul's, we basically have three staff working um, overlapping during the day from Monday to Friday and two on weekends, covering the time basically um, from the morning until midnight. Just wanted to let you know, um, and if you, you may have met some of these individuals because we've been training a lot of these folks at both of the emergency departments, both at St. Paul's and at MSJ. Um, we have a technician and then we have several pharmacists. It's quite a list of individuals. Um, these individuals are actually rotating through a schedule and they're also working at our dispensary. Um, so that's why there's quite a few individuals. We also have to um, provide this service seven days a week and we're backfilling it um, when uh, for va vacation and things like that, which is why we need a big pool for this. Uh, for this. Um, I want to thank those of you that may have um, encountered these individuals or perhaps tripped over them when we've been trying to train so many of these folks in the emergency department in the last uh, number of weeks. So one of the things I think that I mentioned earlier is the BPMH is critical for downstream work, uh, workflow. I think um, for those of you here that are eMERGE physicians, you may not see like a direct value right away in having that BPMH collected and entered into the system. It may help you, um, you know, clarify some aspects of the drug therapy, but it is really important when that patient go, uh, gets admitted by the admitting team, if that's in there, they can do their medication reconciliation quite quickly and, uh, and proceed with admission. So there's a lot of value to flow to getting that BPMH entered um, and completed uh, quickly. And um, it, like I said, it is very important downstream. If we don't get the BPMH and it's not proactive, if it's done after the admission, um, it becomes challenging to do med medication reconciliation, which is uh, re also required in Cerner. So one of the things that we've identified is it's challenging for our staff, although we're certainly screening the patients um, um, and, and looking for patients likely to be admitted, looking at based of number of medications, certainly getting help from Cindy and identifying patients that we know are likely to be admitted. But um, we do know there's sometimes quite a lag in terms of when patients are registered or initially seen and then the time they're admitted. And we're trying to get this BPMH done within that window of time before the team that actually admits the patient sees them and to get have it done and ready. So um, certainly our ask for you is 
whenever possible, if you can help us identify these patients who you know from either your experience or just based on clinically how they're doing, that you know that these patients are very likely going to be admitted. Um, if you can give us the heads up, that would be that would be ideal. That would allow us to get in and get those histories done efficiently and early uh, so that they can be uh, ready for when the admitting team comes. Um, so we do have a bit of an algorithm to help us identify patients. Yes, question at the back. Okay, yeah, I can, I can show you. Um, so certainly we have a couple of different ways that we're trying to identify patients that we think we should have a BPMH done and trying to do this proactively. Certainly we are going to rely on the staff, both the nursing staff and um, eMERGE physicians and others to help us identify these patients. Um, so uh, there's a couple of different ways you could potentially let us know. Um, one is in Cerner, simply doing an order. Um, if you hit that add button and you start typing, um, e, uh, which, if you just type BPMH apparently, you do, um, and if you, and then if you uh, basically sign that, put that in, that what that does is on the eMERGE tracking show, which, which our staff can see, it populates it with a little icon that tells us that a BPMH has been requested, and that allows us to very quickly identify and see those patients. So that basically choosing the order and typing in BPMH and submitting it, that's what would be very helpful for us if you're able to do that. If you also, um, flag us, um, for example, if you see Cindy or if you see one of our, our BPMH staff around and you know that there's a patient you've just seen, you can also um, flag us that way. Um, but this is probably the quickest, most direct way since you'll be in the Cerner system already doing lots of your work just to, to type that in if that would be at all possible. That would be very helpful for us. That puts an icon on the, on the launch point as well, right? So you can yes. see who's been, who's coming to that department. So we're still in the process of actually getting like some of our devices and things, but we will post and have available an, a phone number um, because our, our staff will have, have cell phones, um, both at MSJ and at St. Paul, so you can reach them that way if you have questions. Um, the only other thing I wanted to add is that this staff is a, uh, is a, a complement of both pharmacy technicians and uh, pharmacists. These pharmacists that we've hired are not clinically trained in terms of they don't have the year residency, they don't have the training that Cindy does. So in terms of your clinically related questions, still direct those to Cindy. Cindy is still your go-to clinical pharmacist for the emergency department. We do hope that these individuals will be able to, um, as they get up to speed, maybe help answer some basic questions about medications, but their primary function will be collecting that BPMH. They're very skilled at talking to patients and eliciting that history, but they're probably not going to be your go-to for the um, clinical questions. Yes? So, I know they're going to be overwhelmed at first with all the admissions and stuff that are coming in. If we identify our complex frequent flyer patients or patients who are likely to be in the unit of those types of patients, should we be liking them as well to try to stay in CTU or for geriatrics? That will most likely stay in our eMERGE um, and be potentially, like, depending on, like, how long we first see the patient to be um, staying in eMERGE, then yes, a possible medication history consult would be ideal for those patients as well. Yeah, we're aiming to do 80% of all admitted patients, but like patients at high priority can be seen as well. We're still, I think it's going to take us a little time to figure out um, as we everything goes live exactly in terms of volumes and how, how well we're able to, to handle those volumes. For sure, our priority are admitted patients or patients destined to be admitted. Um, but, um, you know, certainly if there's ones that will reside in the eMERGE for a long period of time that are cl complex medication-wise, we'd be looking um, as we go through time to see whether those would be viable for us to do PPMHs for as well. So I, I know it's a fee-preserved environment, but there's nothing to stop emergency physicians from taking cost-free medication. You want to enter and there's nothing to stop you from doing it. It doesn't take a long time. And the, other, the other thing that is important to note is there are now kind of two sources of medic, potential medication that you could have taken. So let's say they were admitted three months ago. There would be a home medication list of what they were on at the time they were admitted last time. And there's still a PharmaNet uh, 
um, profile, and they may be slightly different. So even if you don't do the records of the, the medication history, you are probably going to have to look at, you know, you may want to look at the two sources of medication. You might go look at the whole medications and say, this is what it says you're on. If you change anything, you might want to just have a quick look at the pharmacy to verify. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out as we go. That that is complexity having the medications documented in Cerner as well as pharma. It's one of the problems when you have less than ideal integration. Ideally, all those pharma, pharma medications would come right in as well as you have to pull them in. Any other questions from the group? All right. Thank you for your time today. We appreciate it.